section sixty nine of the mysteries of london volume three this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by adele pooley the mysteries of london volume three by george w reynolds section sixty nine chapter sixty seven the marriage rosamond a fortnight had passed since the interview between mrs slingsby and sir henry courtenay and the machinations of the latter had so successfully prevailed in accelerating the matters in which he was interested that on the morning when we must request our readers to accompany us to torrens cottage the marriage of adelais and clarence villiers was to take place the young man was still pale from the effects of recent and severe indisposition but the happiness which he had experienced during the last fourteen days had worked a greater physical improvement in him than six months sojourn in the south of france could possibly have done firmly believing that the declining health and drooping spirits of adelais had alone induced mr torrens to revoke a decree which was to have separated them for ever and not over anxious to revive past topics in connections with the subject clarence gave himself completely up to the happiness which now awaited him and his adelais was equally ready to bury in oblivion any disagreeable reflections relative to the late conduct of her father mr torrens was cold moody and distant but this was his manner and as the young people knew not what fierce fires raged beneath that aspect of ice they did not bestow any unusual attention on the subject the only source of grief which the sisters knew was their approaching separation for mr torrens had arranged for the young couple to proceed into devonshire and pass the honeymoon with some distant relations of his own who were anxious to see their beautiful cousin adelais rosamond was to remain with her father mrs slingsby not having as yet sent her invitation to old burlington street for fear that clarence might throw some obstacle in the way of its being accepted thus stood matters on the bridal morning when adelais appeared pre-eminently beautiful in her garb of virgin white emblematically of the innocence of her own heart and when clarence villiers could scarcely persuade himself that he was actually touching on the threshold of complete felicity rosamond poor rosamond smiled amidst the tears that flowed fast down her pale cheeks for she felt as if she were losing her best her only friend in the approaching departure of adelais there was a young lady a friend who acted as joint bridesmaid with rosamond and there were two or three other acquaintances in the family and of the persons thus enumerated consisted the bridal party the sisters had naturally invited mrs slingsby but that lady aware that her presence would not be agreeable to her nephew had sent to plead indisposition as the excuse for her absence and mr torrens what was the nature of his feelings now forced by necessities or rather by that indomitable pride which urged him to take every sacrifice rather than boldly meet his embarrassments in the bankruptcy court he had assented to bestow his elder daughter on a young man whom he disliked and to sell his younger child to an atrocious villain who had not even manifested the delicacy of hinting at marriage reader think not that when we record the dreadful fact of a father consenting to sell his own daughter for gold we are fabricating for a romance an incident which never occurred in real life such things have been done often are done often and will be done often so long as the human species shall exist the immense wealth of that corrupt and detestable monster the late marquis of hertford enabled him to purchase the favours of not only lady s but also induced that profligate woman to sell him every one of her daughters and those daughters have since married titled men and live splendidly upon the riches bequeathed to them by the horrible voluptuary again but a few years have elapsed since a certain lady h sold her beautiful daughter priscilla to a most ignoble lord and the atrocious deed became the topic of numerous articles in the english and continental newspapers the tribunals of france having taken cognizance of the scandal 
we could mention of innumerable instances of this kind the greater portion of which are however confined to the aristocratic circles for it must necessarily occur that the upper classes as they insolently denominate themselves are the most profligate unprincipled and licentious of all the sections into which society is divided wealth and idleness associated must as a general rule give a fearful impulse of immorality rich vines and generous wines must heat the blood and nights of dissipation balls routs soirees and card parties inflame the imagination the voluptuous dances which prevail in those fashionable assemblies the indecent manner in which the ladies of the upper class display so much of the bosom that but little scope is left for the exercise of fancy the positive encouragement that is given in high life to men whose reputation as vile seducers is notorious all these circumstances foster licentiousness and provide a constant element to sustain immorality again the morals of the fashionable world have not recovered from the effects of that dangerous poison which was instilled into them by the evil examples of the family of george the third and the flagrant conduct of the beastly voluptuary george the fourth the licentiousness of the princesses of that family became the public scandal of the day and from the ladies of the court emanated the fashion of wearing hoops to their dresses for a purpose which need not be particularly described but fashion subsists by the artifice of constant change and when hoops had enjoyed their day those ladies who had found them so convenient actually devised the scheme of giving vogue to a padding in front to make the weavers appear in the family way this is no fiction and young unmarried girls as well as married ladies actually submitted to this disgraceful and immoral fashion through servile obedience to the example of the princesses this was positively holding out a premium to licentiousness because the fear of a false step indicating itself by its consequences was annihilated every one knows that many titled ladies gloried in the reputation of being as they really were the mistresses of george the fourth with all these frightful examples in view how could the entire sphere of the fashionable world fail to become dreadfully demoralized and how was it possible to prevent the contaminating influence from spreading to the inferior grades therefore is it that the fashionable world especially being the first to experience that influence and the most likely to perpetuate it has not yet recovered from the effects of the evil example of the court true is it thank god that queen victoria has not followed the same course which so many of her near relatives adopted but still even her bright example can only gradually mitigate and not in a moment destroy the effects of the moral poison instilled into fashionable society by her royal predecessors previously to the first revolution in france the aristocracy was steeped in licentiousness and profligacy but a glorious nation rose in its might hurled down a throne encrusted with the miseries of the people annihilated the bloated and infamous nobility and even gave the proud and arrogant clergy such a lesson as they have never since forgotten the aristocracy of france have never recovered that blow and thank heaven never will the hereditary peerage exists no longer in france and titles of nobility are valueless thus by virtually destroying the aristocracy of rank and birth france has suppressed a sewer of filth and corruption which distilled its abominations through every grade and phase of society the aristocracy of talent has been substituted and the mechanic may now rise to be a minister the ploughman has his fair share of becoming a politician the delver of the soil can aspire to the post of deputy france is regenerated england can become so only by the destruction of its hereditary aristocracy from this long digression we return to the bridal party assembled at torrens cottage and now about to repair to the adjacent church where the nuptial bond was to be indissolubly tied and to that church did the party proceed the father who looked upon his daughters as the means of filling his purse the daughters who knew not the utter selfishness of their sire the young man 
who was so indescribably happy in at length accompanying to the altar her whom he loved so well and the guests who thought as much of the excellent breakfast which followed as of the solemn ceremony itself the banquet passed and the time came for the departure of the newly married couple a post-chaise drove up to the door the trunks were hastily conveyed to the vehicle and Adelais was torn away from the arms of her young sister rosamond who clung frantically to her an hour afterwards the guests were gone and rosamond remained alone with her father god grant that my dearest sister may be happy said the maiden her voice almost completely lost in sobs if she is not it will be her own fault observed mr torrens harshly as he paced the room she would have the young man she set her heart upon him and i have yielded i suppose you are now sorry that she is gone and yet i dare swear you thought me a brutal tyrant for separating the lovesick pair a few weeks ago my dearest dearest father exclaimed rosamond profoundly afflicted and even annoyed at the manner in which she was addressed wherefore speak to me thus have i ever given you any reason to suppose that i was so undutiful as as to run away from the house with your sister eh interrupted mr torrens in a biting satirical tone a young lady who could take such a step would not be very particular in her observations on her father's conduct heavens how have i deserved these reproaches at least to-day asked rosamond bursting into an agony of tears shall not the past be forgotten will you ever continue my dear father to recall those events which are naturally so painful well well let us say no more about it rosamond cried mr torrens ashamed of having vented his ill-humour upon his daughter and he paced the room in a manner denoting a strange and indomitable agitation the fact was that the miserable father recoiled in horror from the atrocity he had agreed to perpetrate and with an idiosyncrasy so common amongst men who tremble upon the verge of committing a fearful crime he turned on the intended victim as if she were the wilful and conscious cause of those black feelings that raged within his breast he had not moral courage sufficient to retreat while it was yet time he dared not make the comparatively small sacrifice of himself to avoid the immeasurably greater one which involved the immolation of his daughter rosamond was already deeply afflicted at parting with her sister that sister from whom she had never been separated until now but she was doomed to experience additional sources of grief in the harsh manner and alarming agitation of her father at length unable any longer to endure the state of suspense and uncertainty in which she was suddenly plunged concerning him she rose from her seat advanced timidly toward him and throwing one of her snowy arms over his shoulder murmured in a plaintive tone father dearest father what dreadful cause of sorrow oppresses you now are you fearful that adelais will not be happy that clarence will not always be good and kind to her oh yes dearest father i am sure he will i am not thinking of the daughter who is gone exclaimed mr torrens suddenly interrupting the maiden and speaking in a tone no longer harsh but positively wild with despair my thoughts are intent on the daughter who is left behind am i a source of affliction to you father asked rosamond contemplating her sire in so plaintive melancholy and yet tender a manner that his vile heart was for a moment touched and he felt ready to throw himself at her feet and implore her pardon for the ill he meditated towards her tell me my beloved parent she said have i given you offence in any way by word or deed oh if i have bitter will be the tears that i shall shed and sincerely most sincerely shall i beseech your forgiveness no rosamond said mr torrens crushing the better feelings of his soul as he thought of the ruin that would envelop him were he to retract his engagements with the baronet you have not offended me and i believe i spoke harshly to you just now without a cause but let us talk no more on that subject compose yourself wipe away those tears i shall now retire to my study for i have letters of importance to write but at that moment the well-known knock of the postman resounded through the house and almost immediately afterwards a servant entered the room handed a letter to rosamond and then withdrew a note for me 
exclaimed the young lady in surprise while mr torrens blood ran cold and his brain whirled oh it is from dear mrs slingsby i recognize the handwriting and hastily opening it she glanced over the contents mr torrens was about to leave the room as if the arrival of the letter were a matter of perfect indifference to him one moment dear father said rosamond detaining him by the arm you must read this beautiful letter which mrs slingsby has written to me and though i cannot think of accepting the kind invitation which it conveys what does mrs slingsby say in her letter then demanded mr torrens all his ill-humour returning as his further step in the hideous plot reawakened his most poignant reflections what does she say that you speak in such enthusiastic terms of a mere letter rosamond placed the note in his hand and mr torrens turning aside toward the window read the contents as follow it has greatly distressed me my beloved young friend to have been unable to attend at the solemnization of the holy and yet deeply affecting ceremony which by the time this reaches you will have united my excellent nephew and your sweet sister but it has pleased the almighty in his inscrutable wisdom to afflict me with a severe rheumatism at this time as i assured you in a previous note and although i sincerely hope that by the blessing of that all-wise being and the aid of the lotion which dr wagtail has sent me i shall be well in a few days yet i am compelled for the present to remain within the house it is my most sincere and heartfelt hope that your dear sister and my beloved nephew may experience all that happiness which the omnipotent may deign to bestow upon his elect one circumstance must essentially tend to smooth down those mundane asperities which alas they will have to encounter in the rough path of life and that is the religious faith with which they are both imbued for myself i can safely declare that if it were not for the consolations which the holy bible imparts to all who study its divine doctrines and for the solace afforded me by a few kind friends amongst whom i must include that most choice vessel of the lord sir henry courtenay i know not how i should bear up against the grievous pains wherewith it has pleased the most high to afflict me and which have just passed from the right foot into the left doubtless it is more my eternal welfare in a better world that i am thus chastened in this although dr wagtail with a levity unbecoming a professional man of his age and standing declares that if i keep my feet well swathed in flannel and take mustard baths on going to bed i shall triumph over the ailment but oh my dearest friend what is flannel without the blessing of heaven what is mustard without the aid of the most high i am very lonely sweet rosamond and i am fearful that you must miss your dear sister much i know that mr torrens occupations take him much from home and thus you cannot always enjoy the presence and the consolations of your excellent father whom i regret to say i only as yet know by good report but whose hand i hope to press some day in friendship will you my love come and pass a week or two with me it will be a perfect charity on your part and i am convinced also that change of scene will cheer your spirits come to me my dearest rosamond early to-morrow morning god willing if your good kind father can spare you ever your sincere and attached friend martha slingsby the vile hypocrisy which characterized this letter enhanced if possible the blackness of that crime toward the consummation of which it was so material a step and mr torrens stood gazing upon the document until all its characters seemed to move and agitate on the surface of the paper like a legion of hideous reptiles swarming together but at length mastering his horribly painful emotions he turned towards his daughter saying and wherefore rosamond should you not accept an invitation as kind as it is considerate oh my dear father exclaimed the maiden i could not think of leaving you at a time when you have just lost the society of one of your children moreover i perceive that you are not entirely happy i fear that those recent embarrassments speak not of them rosamond interrupted mr torrens sternly for so great was his pride that he could not endure the idea of his own daughters being acquainted with his late pecuniary difficulties to return to the subject of that letter he added after a few moments pause i think you cannot do better than accept the invitation 
Indeed, it would appear unkind were you to refuse it. Mrs. Slingsby is suffering from indisposition, and she is evidently anxious to have a companion. Therefore, Rosamond, I must beg you to commence your preparations for the visit. The young lady urged various remonstrances against this resolution, but her father overruled them all, and it was accordingly determined at length that she should repair to Old Burlington Street on the following morning. But when the morning came, and the vehicle which was to convey her to London drove up to the door, how appalling were the feelings which agitated, nay, absolutely enraged in the breast of Mr. Torrance. Acute, intensely acute, was the pain which he endured in endeavouring to subdue those emotions, or rather by composing his features in such a way that his countenance might not indicate the awful warring that disturbed his soul. With streaming eyes did Rosamond take leave of her father, and as she stepped into the chaise, a presentiment of evil flashed across her imagination. But she was young, naturally inclined to look upon the bright side of things, and too inexperienced to know much of the dreadful pitfalls which the artifice of man has hollowed in the pathways of the moral world. Her misgiving was therefore forgotten almost as soon as it was entertained, and she was in comparatively good spirits, though still affected by her recent separation from her sister, when she alighted at the door of Mrs. Slingsby's residence in Old Burlington Street. End of section 69section 70 of the mysteries of london volume 3 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by gillian hendry the mysteries of london volume 3 by george w m reynolds section 70 dr wagtail rosamond torrens Rosamond Torrance found the pious lady reclining on a sofa, and so profoundly absorbed, at all events apparently so, in the perusal of a chapter in the New Testament, that she did not immediately look up when the drawing-room door opened to give the young maiden admission. "'Ah, my dearest girl, is it indeed you?' at length said Mrs. Slingsby, in a dolorous tone of voice, as she laid aside the sacred volume." "'Come and embrace me, sweet Rosamond.' "'I hope you are better to-day, my dear madam,' was a sincere observation made by the intended victim of a damnable plot, as she pressed her pure lips to Mrs. Slingsby polluted brow. "'Heaven blessed me with a good night's rest, my love,' returned the pious lady, "'and Dr. Wagtail would insist upon my taking a little warm brandy and water, although, as you well know, I loathe alcoholic liquor.' which I do not consider to be a good creature of God, nor fitted for our use. But, as a medicine, Rosamond, and when accompanied by urgent prayer, it is beneficial. And now tell me, sweet girl, how passed off the bridal ceremony? Was the conduct of my nephew becoming and proper? I could scarcely suppose otherwise, seeing that for years he has been benefited by the advice and example which it has been my happy lot to afford him. And Adelie, was she much affected, my love? Rosamond described the particulars of the wedding, and Mrs. Slingsby was in the midst of some very comforting remarks thereon, when the door opened and Dr. Wagtail made his appearance. This gentleman was a short, fat, important-looking personage, with a powdered head and a pigtail, delighting, too, in small clothes and black gaiters, and carrying a thick bamboo cane, the gold head of which he invariably applied to his nose when he wanted to appear more than usually solemn. He enjoyed a large practice, and was yet miserably ignorant of the medical art. What, then, was the secret of his success? We will explain the mystery. His father was a very wealthy man, and paid a premium of eight hundred pounds to apprentice the subject of this sketch to the house-surgeon of one of the great metropolitan hospitals. But young Wagtail, though cunning and crafty enough, was a wretched dolt, and only succeeded in passing his examination by dint of the most extraordinary cramming. By these means, however, he became a member of the Royal College of Surgeons, and set up in business for himself. 
the house surgeon of the hospital soon after hinted to him that he intended to resign and mr wagtail senior on hearing this private communication made to his son immediately sent the house surgeon a five hundred pound note in a gold snuff-box as a token of esteem for his high character and of admiration for his splendid talents this was intelligible enough the house surgeon immediately began to canvass his friends on behalf of young wagtail as his successor and when the resignation of the said house surgeon was publicly announced the majority of the persons who had a right to vote were already enlisted in the cause of mr wagtail several of the most eminent surgeons became candidates for the vacancy but their abilities stood no chance when weighed against mr wagtail's interest and mr wagtail was accordingly elected he thus jumped into renown and handsome emolument almost as soon as he entered the profession and things went on smoothly enough for three or four years until he one morning took it into his head to cut off a man's leg when amputation was positively unnecessary a disturbance ensued the thing got into the newspapers and mr wagtail employed three poor authors constantly for six months at half a crown a day each to get up the pamphlets which he issued in his defence he so inundated the british public with his printed statements that he literally bullied or persuaded the majority into a belief that he was right after all and then with becoming indignation he threw up his berth at the hospital took a magnificent house at the west end got his doctor's diploma at the same time and announced through the medium of the morning post morning herald and st james's chronicle that dr wagtail might be consulted daily at his residence from two till seven his father died soon afterwards leaving him a handsome fortune and as the doctor when the time of mourning which he cut as short as possible had expired began to give splendid entertainments his dinners procured him friends and his friends procured him patients in fact he eventually rose so high in public estimation at the west end that he was quoted as the rival of the celebrated dr lascelles but wise men shook their heads as much as to intimate that dr lascelles had more medical knowledge in his little finger than dr wagtail possessed in his entire form but then dr wagtail was so important looking and had such a knowing and mysterious way with him and he never insulted his patients as dr lascelles sometimes did by telling them that they had nothing the matter with them but were mere hypochondriacs on the contrary he would gratify their fancies by prescribing pills and draughts till he made them ill in reality and then he had some little trouble in curing them again but as he administered plenty of medicine shook his head a great many times even when ordering a foot-bath or a bread poultice and dropped mysterious hints about its being very fortunate that he was called in just at that precise moment or else there would have been no answering for the consequences as he did all this and was particularly liberal to nurses valets and ladies maids he had worked his way up to a degree of eminence which real talent legitimately exercised struggled fruitlessly in ninety-nine cases out of a hundred to arrive at such was the physician who now entered the drawing-room where mrs slingsby was reclining on the sofa with rosamond seated near her bowing with important condescension to miss torrens the doctor quietly took the chair which she vacated because it was close to his patient rosamond was about to quit the room when mrs slingsby desired her to remain adding dr wagtail does not require your absence my love there is nothing so very important in my case is there doctor important my dear madam is not precisely the word returned the physician with his gold-headed cane to his nose inasmuch as your ailment is important as all ailments are when though trivial in themselves they may lead to dangerous consequences but how are we to-day my dear madam how is the pain in our legs did we suffer much last night or did we feel a little easier yes doctor thank you replied the sufferer who had nothing at all the matter with her but who had merely simulated indisposition as an excuse for absenting herself from the bridal i passed a better night by the blessing of heaven <laughs>
"'Well, come, and so we are getting on nicely, eh?' observed the doctor. "'And what did we take for supper last evening?' "'A little gruel, doctor, as you ordered,' answered Mrs. Slingsby, in a lachrymose tone, which was really natural enough, seeing that she could have eaten a roast fowl instead of the farinaceous slop. "'And did we take a very little brandy and water, hot?' asked Dr. Wagtail, in a most insinuating voice, as much as to say that he knew very well how revolting such a beverage must have been to Mrs. Slingsby, although, in his heart, he had recommended it simply because experience had taught him that ladies of a certain age did not object to a small dose of cognac. Did we take a little brandy and water? I did so far follow your advice, doctor, replied Mrs. Slingsby, but I hope I am not to continue it. Indeed, but we must, though, my dear madam, exclaimed the physician, shaking his head most solemnly, and with all the air of a man enforcing the necessity of swallowing a nauseous draught. Indeed, but we must, though, and a trifle stronger, too, a mere trifle, but stronger it must be, or I really cannot answer for the consequences. And here he looked at Miss Torrens, as much as to imply that Mrs. Slingsby's life would perhaps be endangered if his advice were not punctually and accurately followed. "'Well, doctor,' said the suffering lady, in a more doleful tone than ever, "'if it must be stronger, it shall be. But pray make a cure of me, God willing, as soon as possible, so that I may renounce that vile alcoholic beverage.' "'We must have patience, my dear madam, great patience.' said Dr. Wagtail, with increasing solemnity, as he rubbed his nose against the gold-headed cane. Indeed, so long as this nasty rheumatism hangs about us, we must keep to the brandy and water. The physician knew very well that his words would cause the rheumatism to hang about the excellent lady for a considerable time. Indeed, that she would be in no hurry to get rid of it, so long as he prescribed the vile alcoholic beverage and he foresaw a goodly number of fees resulting from the judicious mode which he thus adopted of treating an ailment that did not exist. "'And now, my dear madam,' he continued, "'how is our tongue? Ah, not quite right yet. And how are our pulse?' Then, as the case was pronounced to be important, the doctor lugged out an enormous gold stopwatch, and bent over it with a mysterious and even ominous expression of countenance as he felt the patient's pulse. "'Well, doctor, what do you think?' asked Mrs. Slingsby, looking as anxious and miserable as if she had been in the dock at the Old Bailey, about to hear the verdict of the jury. "'We must take care of ourselves, my dear madam, we must take care of ourselves,' said the physician, shaking his head. "'Our pulse is not quite as it ought to be. How is our appetite? Do we think we could manage a little slice of boiled fowl to-day?' "'But we must try, my dear madam, we must try. "'And we must take a glass or two of wine, port wine, of a good body. "'We must not reduce ourselves too low. "'And this evening for supper we must take gruel again, "'and the brandy and water as an indispensable medicine afterwards.' "'I will endeavour to follow your advice, my dear sir,' said Mrs. Slingsby, "'though heaven knows that the idea of the old port wine at dinner.' "'Well, my dear madam, I know it is repugnant to you, very repugnant,' interrupted the physician in a calmly remonstrative tone. "'But the world cannot afford to lose so excellent a member of society as yourself. Consider your friends, my dear madam. Exert yourself on their account. Triumph over these little aversions to wine and brandy, and take them as medicines, in which sense do I offer them.' "'And now, my dear madam, I will write you out a little prescription. "'You had better get it made up as usual at Timmins and Jake's in Bond Street. "'I have no interest in recommending them, you know, not the slightest, "'but I am sure their drugs are good, my dear madam.' "'Which was as much as to imply that the drugs of other chemists were not good, "'and we may here observe that the disinterested physician "'merely received a thousand a year from Messrs. Timmins and Jake's, for recommending all his patients to send his prescriptions to their shop. The doctor wrote some professional hieroglyphics upon a slip of paper, and scrawled at the bottom something which would have represented the name of Snooks, or Brown, or Thompson, quite as well as it did Wagtail. He then rose, 
received from Mrs. Slingsby his fee, neatly wrapped up in a piece of tissue paper, and took his departure, holding his stick to his nose all the way downstairs. The afternoon passed away somewhat tediously for Rosamond, and when dinner was placed on the table, Mrs. Slingsby contrived to do honour to the boiled fowls, and though she held forth at considerable length upon her abhorrence for port wine, she managed to swallow four glasses of the generous juice, in a manner which Rosamond considered highly creditable to her moral courage, seeing how much she detested it. Shortly after dinner, which was served in the drawing-room, Sir Henry Courtenay made his appearance. The baronet's eyes sparkled with delight when he beheld his intended victim at the pious lady's abode, and looking more sweetly beautiful, more divinely interesting, than she had ever yet appeared to him. The blood boiled in his veins, as his glances rapidly swept her slight but symmetrical form, and as he thought within the recesses of his own iniquitous heart, "'This night thou shalt become mine!' It will be remembered that during the last few days of her previous sojourn at Mrs. Slingsby's abode, Rosamond had been taught to form a very high opinion of the baronet, but the pious lady had not gone so far as to instil any voluptuous sentiment into the mind of the young maiden. Thus, when the baronet, on the occasion of his visits to Torrens Cottage, had addressed her in a somewhat equivocal manner, she did not comprehend him, and hence Sir Henry's reproach against Mrs. Slingsby that she was but an indifferent tutoress. Still, Rosamond was predisposed to admire the baronet's character, as it had been represented to her by Mrs. Slingsby, and she was by no means sorry that he had arrived to vary the monotony of the evening. He exerted all his conversational powers to please her, and she could not conceal from herself the delight which she experienced in listening to those outpourings of a well-informed mind and a richly cultivated intellect. The supper hour arrived while she thought the evening was still young, so rapidly had the time passed away. Mrs. Slingsby partook of her gruel with as good a grace as she could possibly assume, but she ever and anon cast a longing glance towards the more substantial and succulent viands spread upon the board. The brandy and water was, however, a consolation, and this the baronet, who mixed for her, made as strong as she could wish, and much stronger than Dr. Wagtail, where he really sincere in his advice, could have possibly intended her to take it. Shortly before eleven, the baronet rose and took his departure, Mrs. Slingsby ringing the drawing-room bell for the servant to open the front door for him, with a ceremony the object of which was to let every one in the house know that he had departed, and the hour at which he went, in case of any exposure following the dread plot now in progress. Mrs. Slingsby and Rosamond then remained in conversation for a few minutes, the topic being the excellent qualities of Sir Henry Courtenay. "'Rosamond, my love,' at length said Mrs. Slingsby, "'before you retire to your own chamber, have the kindness to lock the sideboard in the drawing-room, and bring me the keys, for really servants are so neglectful.' The beautiful girl departed with the alacrity of an obliging disposition to execute this little commission. But the moment she had quitted the drawing-room, Mrs. Slingsby emptied the dark contents of a very small phial into the only half-finished glass of port wine which Rosamond had left. The infamous woman then resumed her recumbent position upon the sofa, and, oh, the abominable mockery, appeared to be occupied with her Bible, when the artless, innocent, and unsuspecting maiden returned to the room. "'Here are the keys, my dear madam,' said Rosamond and everything is safe downstairs. I shall now wish you a good night's rest. "'Finish your wine, my love, before you retire,' observed Mrs. Slingsby, in a softly persuasive tone. "'I am not mean, but you know that I am averse to waste in any shape.' Rosamond blushed at having merited the species of reproach thus conveyed, and drank the contents of her wine-glass. Then, as it struck her that the flavour of the wine was somewhat less pleasant than it should be, but without attaching the least importance to the idea, and forgetting it altogether a moment afterwards, she ate a small piece of bread to take away the disagreeable taste. "'Good night, my dear madam,' said the maiden, bending over the pious lady and kissing her cheek. "'Good night, Rosamond, my love,' returned Mrs. Slingsby, 
I shall remain here for a quarter of an hour to perform my usual devotional exercises, and then I shall retire to my own chamber. Rosamond withdrew and sped to the room prepared for her. She felt wearied and made haste to lay aside her garments and arrange her hair, but in the midst of her occupation a sensation of deep drowsiness came over her, and she was glad to step into bed as speedily as possible, omitting for perhaps the first time since her childhood to kneel down first in prayer. A minute afterwards, and she was sound asleep. Three persons at that precise period had their minds filled with the image of Rosamond. In the solitude of his chamber, at his lonely cottage, Mr. Torrens endured the torments of the damned, mental torments, indescribably more severe than the most agonising of physical pain could possibly be. Mercenary, selfish, cold, callous as he was, he could not stifle the still small voice of conscience which told him he had done a flagrant, a vile, an awful deed, which would fill his cup with a bitterness that no earthly pleasure, no mundane reward, could possibly counteract or change. He felt that he was a monster in human shape. He was afraid to catch a glimpse of his own countenance in the glass, for when he once surveyed it rapidly, its workings were horrible to behold. To sell his daughter for the filthy lucre which had tempted him, it was horrible, atrocious. And then, then at that very moment, while he was pacing his chamber, the fell deed might be in consummation. He walked to the window. How black was the night! How menacing were those clouds that seemed laden with storm! He started back with a look of horrified amazement. Was there not some dreadful shape in the air? Assumed not those clouds the form of a tremendous being, with a countenance of lowering vengeance and awful threatenings? No, it was fancy, and yet the temporary creation of that fancy was dreadful to behold, as cloud piled on cloud, for an instant wore the semblance of a supernal, moving phantom, black and menacing with impending storm. The guilty, wretched father clenched his fists, gnashed his teeth, knit his brows, and compressed his lips together to prevent his voice from suddenly shrieking forth in accents of heartfelt agony. Having remained for about twenty minutes in the drawing-room, Mrs. Slingsby summoned her maid, by whose assistance she gained her own chamber, although she in reality no more required such aid than did the servant who afforded it. The maid helped her mistress to divest herself of her clothing, and then retired. And now Mrs. Slingsby, instead of seeking her couch, that couch which had been the scene of guilty pleasure when Jacob Smith had lain concealed beneath it, seated herself in a large armchair to wait until the house was quiet. "'I could wish that anything rather than this was to take place,' she murmured two or three times. "'Heaven only knows what will be the end of it. But Henry appears so confident of being able to appease her, so certain of reducing her even to the position of one who beseeches instead of menacing, that I am inclined to suppose he has well weighed all the difficulties of his task. At all events he has promised to spare me, to make me appear innocent.' But will Rosamond be so deceived? No, no, she will view me with suspicion. Her eyes will gradually open. And yet, thought Mrs. Slingsby, suddenly interrupting the current of her reflections, she will be so completely in my power, at my mercy. Her honour will be in my hands. Her reputation will depend on my secrecy. Oh, how I wish this night was past, she cried passionately for the deed which is to mark it is horrible to contemplate. And the third person, whose mind was so full of the image of Rosamond Torrance at the time when she lay down, beauteous and chaste virgin as she was, to rest beneath the roof of one whom, in her ingenuous confidence, she believed to be a pattern of female excellence and virtue, that third person was Sir Henry Courtney. The baronet, on quitting Mrs. Slingsby's house, had returned home in his carriage, which was at the door ready to convey him thither, and, on entering his abode, he had immediately repaired to his own chamber. Dispensing with the services of his valet, he sat down to pass away in voluptuous reflections the hour that must elapse before he could set forth again, 
to return to the dwelling of his mistress in Old Burlington Street. He was of that age when the physical powers somewhat require the stimulus of an ardent and excited imagination, and he now began to gloat in anticipation of the joys which he promised himself to experience in the ruin of the hapless Rosamond. Remorse and compunction touched him not. If he thought of the grief that was to ensue, it was merely because he rearranged in his head all the details of the eloquent representations he must make to soothe that woe. Besides, his licentious imagination represented to him the beauteous Rosamond, more beauteous in her tears, and he had worked himself up to a pitch of such maddening desire, by the time it was necessary for him to sally forth, that he would not have resigned his expected prize. No, not if the ruin and disgrace of ten thousand families were to ensue. Leaving his house stealthily, by a means of egress at the back, Sir Henry Courtney hastened back to Old Burlington Street. A few moments after he had reached the immediate vicinity of Mrs. Slingsby's residence, the clocks of the West End churches proclaimed the hour of one. That was the appointed time for his admission into the house. Nor had he long to wait, for the front door was soon opened noiselessly and cautiously, and by a person bearing no light, but the voice which whispered, "'Is it you, Henry?' was that of Mrs. Slingsby. And noiselessly and cautiously, too, she led the way upstairs, he having previously put off his shoes, which he carried in his hand. At the door of her own bedroom, Mrs. Slingsby made the baronet pause for an instant while she procured a taper, and as she handed it to him, and the light revealed their countenances to each other, they shrank from each other's gaze for human nature at that instant asserted its rightful empire, and while the woman recoiled with horror from the man who was about to commit an awful outrage on a member of her own sex, the man felt a momentary loathing for the woman who was aiding and abetting in the work of this foul night. Mrs. Slingsby hurriedly pointed towards a door at the bottom of the passage, in the most retired part of the house, and she then retreated into her own room, a prey to feelings which a convict in Newgate need not have envied. Meantime, Sir Henry Courtney had passed on to the extremity of the passage, and now his hand is upon the door. He opens that door, he enters, he closes and fastens it behind him. Advancing towards the bed, he holds the taper so that its light falls upon the pillow, and the soft, mellow lustre of the wax candle reveals a charming countenance, with flushed cheeks and with rosy lips apart. For Rosamond's slumber is uneasy, though profound, doubtless the effect of laudanum upon the nerves of one so entirely unaccustomed to its use, and who has imbibed so large a dose. And one of those flushed cheeks reposed on a round, full and naked arm, like a red rose-leaf upon Parian marble, and the other arm was thrown over the bedclothes, which had been somewhat disturbed by the uneasiness of the maiden's sleep, and left exposed the polished shoulders of dazzling whiteness, and the bosom of virgin rotundity and plumpness. Oh, what a charming picture was thus revealed to the eyes of the lustful miscreant, whose desires were increased to almost raging madness by the spectacle. He placed the taper on the mantel, and hastened to lay aside, nay, almost to tear off his garments, and in less than three minutes he was lying by the side of the young virgin. But scarcely had his rude hand invaded the treasures of her bosom when she awoke with a faint scream and a sudden start, the result of some disagreeable dream, and then the baronet clasped her with all the fury of licentiousness in his arms. A few moments elapsed ere she was aroused sufficiently to comprehend the dreadful, the horrible truth but when the torpor produced by the laudanum had somewhat subsided, she became a prey to the most frightful alarms, produced by the conviction that someone had invaded the sanctity of her couch, and a glance showed her the features of Sir Henry Courtney. She would have given vent to her anguish and her horror in appalling screams, but he placed his hand over her mouth, he muttered fearful menaces in her ears, he called God to witness his resolution to possess her, and though she became bewildered and dismayed, though her brain whirled and her reason seemed to be deserting her, yet she battled with the ravisher, 
she maintained a desperate and awful struggle and so unrelenting was the violence which he used to restrain and overpower her that murder would have perhaps been done had not the poor victim become insensible in his arms and then her ruin was accomplished o oh, ye clouds laden with storm why gave ye not forth your forked lightnings why sent ye not abroad your thunders to smite the hero of that foul night for oh while the father was still pacing his chamber in his own dwelling the hell that raged in his breast defying all hope of slumber while too the no less infamous woman who had pandered to this work of ruin was trembling rather for what might be the consequences than for the deed itself there in that room to which rosamond had retired in the pride of innocence and chastity there was she despoiled there became she the victim of the miscreant ravisher release me let me depart let me fly implored the wretched rosamond in a tone so subdued with anguish and with weakness that there was no fear of its alarming the house rosamond hear me i beseech you exclaimed the baronet as he held her by the arms in such a manner that she could not escape from the bed hear reason if you can what would you do whither can you fly the past cannot be recalled but there is much to think of for the future the occurrence of this night is a secret known only to yourself and to me your dishonour need never transpire to the world oh my god my god murmured rosamond in a tone of ineffable anguish my dishonour my dishonour and she repeated the word the terrible word in so thrilling penetrating and yet subdued a voice that even the remorseless baronet was for a moment touched oh rosamond he said in a hurried and excited manner do not repine so bitterly for what cannot be recalled think how i love you dearest one remember that my passion for thee amounted to a frenzy and it was in frenzy that i acted thus instead of loathing me no no i do not loathe you my god no said rosamond becoming the least degree calmer i now perceive how dependent i am upon you how necessary it is that your love should console me but my dear father should he learn his daughter's disgrace oh heaven have mercy upon me and she once more burst into an agony of weeping rosamond rosamond compose yourself said sir henry courtenay with that tenderness of tone which he so well knew how to assume and on which he had so much relied as an emollient means to be applied to soothe the grief of the victim of his desires shall i repeat how deeply i love thee how ardently i adore thee oh my best beloved do not thus abandon yourself to the wildness of a vain and useless despair but have i not been made the victim of a dreadful conspiracy said rosamond was i not inveigled hither to be ruined oh i will fly i will fly i will hasten home to my father i will throw myself at his feet and tell him all and he will pardon and avenge me again she endeavoured to spring from the bed but sir henry courtney held her back and through sheer exhaustion she fell weeping on his breast then the task of consoling her or rather of somewhat moderating the excess of her anguish became more easy and the baronet reasoned and vowed argued and protested and pleaded for pardon so touchingly and with so much apparent contrition that rosamond began to believe there was indeed some extenuation for one who loved her so passionately and who had been led away by the frenzy of those feelings of which she was the object oh why my adored girl are you so beautiful murmured the baronet rather attribute my crime to the influence the irresistible influence of thine own charms than to any deeply seated wickedness on my part i should have become raving mad for love of thee had not the fury of my passion hurried me on to that point when reckless of all consequences i had recourse to this stratagem i know that my conduct is horrible that it is vile and base in the extreme but i sue to thee for pardon i so proud and haughty yes i implore thee my darling rosamond to forgive me and oh if all the remainder of my life devoted to thine happiness can atone for my turpitude of this night if the most unwearied affection 
the most tender love can impart consolation to thee my angel then wilt thou yet smile upon me and the past shall be forgotten then you will make me your wife murmured rosamond yes sweet girl thou shalt become mine mine in the sight of heaven said the baronet who would have made any pledge at that moment in order to solace and reassure his victim but wherefore not have told me that you loved me why not have demanded my hand of my father and have married me as clarence did my sister asked rosamond a doubt striking to her heart's core i said many things to make you understand how dear you were to me answered the baronet and you did not comprehend my meaning remember you not that one day when i called at your father's house i met you alone in the parlour and as you offered me your hand i said happy will the man be on whom this fair hand shall be bestowed and on another occasion when you and i were again alone together the conversation happened to turn upon death and i remarked that it was dreadful to contemplate the idea of dying but that i could lay down my life to serve you oh yes i remember now murmured rosamond and i even thought of those observations after you were gone and they seemed to afford me pleasure to ponder upon them do you not now understand then dearest angel how disappointment at finding that i was not at once comprehended drove me to despair said the wily baronet can you not pardon me if thus driven to desperation i vowed to possess you to make you mine so that you would be compelled to accept my hand as you already reigned undisputed mistress over my heart if you will fulfil your solemn promise to make me your wife i shall yet be happy and this dreadful night may be forgotten no not forgotten continued rosamond hastily because the memory is immortal for such hours of anguish as these but you will at least make all the atonement that lies in your power and i may yet look the world in the face rosamond my sweet rosamond within a month from this time thou shalt be my wife said the baronet with that assurance i must console myself returned the still weeping girl and now i adjure you by the solemnity of the pledge which you have made me and which i believe i implore you by that love which you declare you entertain for me to leave me this moment the baronet was fearful of reviving the storm of grief which his perfidious language had succeeded in quelling and he accordingly rose and resumed his apparel not a word was spoken during the two or three minutes which thus passed and when sir henry was once more dressed he approached the ruined girl saying one embrace rosamond and i leave thee till the morrow one word ere we part she said in a hurried and almost hollow tone does mrs slingsby know but surely surely she could not have lent herself and yet added the bewildered rosamond a second time interrupting herself abruptly how could you have gained admittance into the house and in the middle of the night oh heavens the most fearful suspicions calm yourself compose your feelings dearest said the baronet mrs slingsby knows that i adore you is aware that i love you because the long acquaintance indeed the sincere friendship which exists between us prevents me from having any secrets unrevealed to her but wrong not that amiable that excellent that pure-minded woman by unjust suspicions i entered her house like a thief by means of a window accidentally left unfastened and in the same manner must i escape now not for worlds would i have her suspect the occurrences of this night therefore my angel compose yourself so that your appearance may not engender any suspicion in her mind when you meet at the breakfast-table in the morning for remember my rosamond you will shortly become my wife and then as you yourself observed you will be enabled to look the world in the face and until that moment comes said rosamond with a deep sob i shall blush and be compelled to cast down my eyes in the presence of every one who knows me oh my god what cruel fears what dread thoughts oppress me and my sister is doubtless so happy heaven grant that she may never know the anguish which wrings my heart at this moment 
by everything sacred i conjure you to compose yourself rosamond exclaimed sir henry courtenay now afraid to leave her lest in the dread excitement which was reanimating her she might lay violent hands upon herself for by the light of the taper he could perceive that her countenance was ashy pale and that while she was uttering those last words relative to her sister her features were suddenly distorted by an expression of intense mental agony compose myself oh how can i compose myself she exclaimed and then she burst into a torrent of tears the baronet knew the female heart too well not to allow her to give full vent to the pearly tide of anguish and three or four minutes elapsed he standing by the bed contemplating with but little emotion unless indeed it were of lust the beauteous being whom he had so ruthlessly ruined and she burying her face in her hands the tears trickling between her fingers and her agonizing sobs alone breaking the solemn stillness of the night sir henry courtney waited until the violence of this renewed outburst of ineffable woe had somewhat abated and then he again endeavoured to console the unhappy victim of his foul desires the ruined sufferer by his hellish turpitude and rosamond had so much need of solace and was so dependent on hope for the future to enable her to sustain the almost crushing misery of the present that she threw herself upon his honour his mercy his deceitful promises and she even smiled but faintly oh very faintly when he again employed his infernal sophistry to prove the deed of that dread night to be the surest testimony to his ardent love at length she was sufficiently composed to induce him to take his departure and like a vile snake as he was in heart he crept away from the chamber of the deflowered the ravished girl as he stole thus stealthily along the passage he observed a light streaming from mrs slingsby's room the door of which had been purposely left ajar he entered and found his accomplice still up nor had the abandoned woman felt the least inclination to retire to rest for her mind had been a prey to the most terrible alarms from the moment when the baronet had first set foot in rosamond's chamber i have succeeded and she will not proclaim the outrage to the world said sir henry courtney in a low tone i have moreover kept my word with you and have made her believe that you are innocent of any share in the proceeding mrs slingsby gave no answer but bit her underlip forcibly for vile as she herself was she could hardly prevent herself from exclaiming to her companion you are a black-hearted monster sir henry did not however notice that she was influenced by any emotion hostile to him or if he did he cared not to show that he perceived it but wishing his mistress good night he quitted the room and stole out of the house End of section seventy. Section seventy one of the Mysteries of London, Volume three. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Mysteries of London, Volume three by George W. M. Reynolds. Chapter sixty nine. Misery and Vice. A week had elapsed since the perpetration of the atrocity described in the preceding chapter. The scene changes to a miserable garret in one of the foul courts leading out of King Street, St. Giles's. It was about eight o'clock in the evening, and the rain pattered on the roof and against the little window of the wretched room, which, small as it was, was scarcely lighted by the candle that flickered with the draught gushing in from beneath the door. On a mean and sordid mattress stretched upon the floor, and with but a thin and torn blanket to cover him, lay a man who was not in reality above five-and-twenty, but who seemed nearly double that age, so ghastly was his countenance, and so attenuated was his form with sickness and want. Near him a young female, almost a mere girl, was seated on a broken chair. Her apparel was mean and so scanty that she shivered with the cold and though the traces of famine and care were plainly visible upon her features, yet they had not carried their ravages so far as to efface the prettiness which naturally characterized the composition of that countenance. 
Beautiful she was not, nor ever had been, but good-looking she decidedly was. And though attired almost in rags and with an expression of profound misery upon her face, there was something interesting in the appearance of that poor creature. The reader will remember that in the earlier chapters of this tale we introduced him to one of those dens of iniquity called low lodging-houses in Castle Street, Longacre, and he will also recollect that a mock marriage took place in that padding ken between a thief called Josh Pedler and a poor labourer's daughter named Matilda Briggs. The man lying on the mattress in the garret was Josh Pedler, and the girl sitting near him was Matilda Briggs. "'Well, now,' suddenly exclaimed Pedler, as he raised himself with difficulty to a sitting posture, "'what do you say in answer to my last question? Are we to die of starvation, or are we to have bread by some means or another?' Matilda burst into tears and wrung her hands bitterly. "'Don't sit whimpering there, damn your eyes,' cried the ruffian. "'Blubbering won't do no good, and you know that as well as me.' Here I have been on my beam ends, as one might say, for the last three weeks, and unable to go about to pick up a single farthing. The landlord swears he will have some money to-morrow morning, all the things is pawned. And here am I, only wanting a little proper nourishment to set me on my legs again, but that I can't get. God knows I have starved myself to give you all I could, Josh, said Matilda, her voice broken with frequent and agonizing sobs. When you have asked me if I had kept enough meat or bread for myself, I always answered yes, and I turned my back towards you that you mightn't see how much, or rather how little, I had kept back. But what can I do? My father and mother are gone back into the country to throw themselves on their parish. I have no friends to apply to, and yours seem unable to assist you at present. Something must be done, Tilda, said the man. We can't starve. We must do anything rather than that. I am as hungry as the very devil now, and I know that if I had a good steak and some porter it would put me all right again. But, my God, we have not even the means to buy a penny roll, almost shrieked the young woman. There isn't a thing left to pawn. I have nothing but this old gown on my back. Everything else has gone. Gone, she added hysterically, as she threw a wild glance around the naked and dismantled garret. How cold it is, too. What can we do? What can we do? and she rocked herself to and fro in a manner denoting an utter despair. "'You keep asking what can be done,' said Josh Pedler brutally, "'and yet you know all the time there's only one thing to be done, and that it must come to that at last.' Matilda started and turned a glance of horrified amazement upon her companion. "'Well, so I suppose you understand what I mean,' continued the ruffian. "'And therefore there's no use in gammoning about it no longer. "'We're starving, and there's the rent to pay.' That's one side of the question. You're a good-looking young woman and can do as other women do. That's t'other side of the question. Oh, Josh! And would you have me become a prostitute? shrieked Matilda in a tone of mingled horror and reproach. Come, none of your nonsense, my lady, said Josh Pedler, or I shall precious soon know how to settle your hash. Either go and earn some tin or cut your luck altogether. If I starve, I'll starve by myself. "'My God, I will not abandon you,' murmured the unhappy young creature, terrified by this menace of separation from one to whom she had grown greatly attached. "'No, I cannot. I will not leave you, Josh. And yet—' "'Let's have no more of this humbug, Tilda,' exclaimed the man brutally. "'Leave off whimpering, or ill as I am, I'll give you something worth crying for. "'Come, put on your bonnet and tramp, or by hell—' "'Oh, you could not.' "'You would not do me a mischief,' she cried, clasping her hands together. "'And if I obey you now in what you have ordered me to do, "'shall you not hate and detest me ever afterwards?' "'Not a bit of it,' returned Josh Pedler, "'softening a little as he perceived that his point was already well-nigh gained. "'For the poor young woman found powerful incentives to yield to the commands of the ruffian, "'she herself being almost famished. "'Not a bit of it,' he repeated. You ought to have turned out when I was first taken ill, and then if I'd had common necessaries, I should have got well by this time. So be a good girl, and see if you can't bring back something good to eat and drink, and a trifle to pay the landlord. With a bursting heart, Matilda rose from her seat and put on her bonnet and her scanty shawl, poor rag which the pawnbroker had refused to advance a single penny upon. 
"'Give us a kiss afore you go, old gal,' said Josh Pedler, by way of affording her some encouragement to begin the frightful course of prostitution to which he strove to urge her. She bent down and pressed her lips upon his forehead, murmuring, "'Are you sure that you will not loathe me afterwards?' "'Don't have any more of that gammon, Tilda,' he cried, "'but cut along, or I shall be tempted to bite a piece out of your face. I'm so thundering hungry.' Matilda shuddered from head to foot and rushed from the room. As she was about to quit the house, a door in the passage opened, and a stout, ill-looking fellow without a coat and smoking a short pipe came forth, exclaiming, "'Ah, I knowed it was you by your sneaking step. Now I tell you what it is, Mrs. Pedler. If so be I don't have my rent or a good part on to-night, you and your man must tramp before I shuts up. I've got people as will be glad to have an airy and comfortable room like yourn, and as will pay. Leastways, I'll get rid of you.' Matilda stayed to hear no more, but rushed wildly from the house, the threat of the landlord ringing like the knell of hope in her ears. She observed not which direction she was pursuing. She saw not the passengers who jostled her on either side. Her eyes were open, and yet the surrounding and the passing objects formed only one vast void, one tremendous blank to her. Her pace was hurried like that of a person intent on some important mission, and having some defined and positive end in view and yet she had even forgotten the motive that had sent her forth into the streets that evening to dare the cold wind and face the pattering rain, she who had but so scanty a clothing to protect her. There was a humming noise in her ears, but she could not discriminate the sounds of voices from the roll of carriages, and even when she crossed the street it was through no caution exercised on her part that she was not ran over. At last her ideas began to assume a more settled shape, and her thoughts, rescuing themselves as it were from utter confusion, settled gradually down into their proper cells in the brain, the racking brain which held them. She walked slower and with more apparent uncertainty of aim. Objects assumed a defined shape to her eyes, and her ears recognized the various sounds which raised the echoes of the streets. At length she stood still in the midst of Holborn, and tears burst from her eyes, for now she remembered that she was there, there in the wide and open thoroughfare to commence the dread avocation of a prostitute. She shuddered from head to foot, but with no ordinary tremor. It was a convulsion which began at the very heart and vibrated with electric rapidity and spasmodic violence throughout the entire form. "'Now then, young Volman, out of the vey!' cried a porter, carrying a huge load upon his head. And like a startled deer, Matilda hurried along. She glanced to the left and to the right, and beheld magnificent shops teeming with merchandise and crowded with purchasers. She lingered in front of the pastry-cook's establishments, and she stopped to devour with her eyes the smoking joints, the piles of vegetables, and the large tins full of pudding in the windows of the eating-houses. But she knew it was useless to implore a meal, and moreover it was something beyond food that she required. For money to pay her heartless landlord she must have. She resumed her mournful, melancholy walk, now slow in pace and drooping in gait. Time was wearing on. Nine o'clock would soon strike, and if she were ever to take the first step in a loathsome trade, now was the moment. Think not, reader, that because this young woman had become the mistress of a thief and had passed through all the training of a low lodging-house and several weeks of misery and want, think not that she was prepared to rush at once and in a moment on a career of public prostitution. No. She was attached to her lover in the first place. And secondly, she was no brazen-faced slut whose mind had derived coarseness from intemperance or callousness from ill-treatment. She shrank from the path which alone seemed open to her. She recoiled from the ways into which a stern necessity commanded her to enter. While she was endeavouring to subdue the bitterness of the reflections which crowded upon her soul, a young woman scarcely a year older than herself accosted her and said, "'My dear, are you come on this beat to be one of us?' Matilda saw by a glance that the female was one of the lowest class of prostitutes, and she burst into tears. "'Oh! Then you are come out for that purpose,' exclaimed the other. "'Well, you must pay your footing at all events,' and making a signal to several of her friends who stood at a short distance, she cried, "'Here's a precious lark, a gal which wants to be one of us, and is blubbering at it.' Matilda was now surrounded by loose women who vowed she should treat them or they would tear her eyes out. Vainly did she protest that she had no money, tears and remonstrances were of no avail, and the prostitutes were growing more clamorous, for it must be remembered there were no new police in those days, 
when an old man decently dressed but horribly ugly stopped near the group and asked what was the matter. "'Here's a young gal which wants to go upon the town and can't pay her footing,' explained one of the loose women, "'and so she shan't come on our beat.' "'Come, come,' said the old man. "'Don't tease the poor thing. Which is she?' "'Oh, rather good-looking.' Well, my dears, here's half a crown for you to get something to drink, and I'll get the young woman to take a little walk along with me. Thus speaking, the old man handed the coin to the girl who had given him the above recorded explanation, and she and her friends were too much rejoiced at the receipt of this unexpected donation to trouble themselves further concerning Matilda Briggs. When the loose women had disappeared, the old man turned towards Matilda and said, Take my arm, my dear, and I'll conduct you to a nice place where we can have a chat together for a half an hour or so and I'll make you a present of half a guinea before we part. The unfortunate girl obeyed in silence, but not quite mechanically. Gratitude for the seasonable assistance she had received from the old man and the idea of obtaining enough money not only to buy food, but also liquidate the greater portion of the arrears of rent due to the merciless landlord, were powerful motives to stifle compunctious feelings in her breast. The old man was one of those sexagenarian voluptuaries who dishonor gray hairs, one of those hoary sinners who prowl about the streets after dusk to pick up girls of tender age and who seldom choose females of ripe years. Under ordinary circumstances this old man would not have bestowed the slightest notice upon Matilda, because she was between fifteen and sixteen, and he affected children of eleven and twelve. But the incident which had brought them together had given him a sudden zest for novelty, and thus the grey-headed reprobate, who was old enough to be Matilda's great-grandfather, tucked her under his arm and led her off to the nearest brothel, with which he was acquainted. It was eleven o'clock when the door of the garret in which Josh Pedler was lying opened abruptly, and Matilda made her appearance. "'Well, what news?' demanded the man anxiously. "'You've left me long enough.' "'I could not return sooner,' answered the young woman in a hoarse and strangely altered tone. But sit up and eat your fill, Josh, for here is a good plate of meat. And the landlord, interrupted the thief joyfully, is paid every farthing. I have earned a sovereign by yielding to the hideous embraces of an old man, she added in a tone expressive of deep and concentrated emotion, an old man whose touch was horrible as the pawings of an imp or some filthy monster. But he gave me double what he first promised, and now you may eat if you can, she exclaimed with a hysterical laugh. "'And you will sit down and eat with me, Tilda,' said the thief in a coaxing tone, for now he saw that his mistress might become serviceable to him, and he was anxious to conciliate her. "'No, not a morsel,' she replied impatiently. "'I am not hungry now. Besides, even if I was, it would seem to me that I was eating my own flesh and blood. But I have got some spirits in a bottle, Josh, and I can drink a drop with you.' "'I thought you didn't like spirits, Tilda,' observed the man, contemplating with some degree of alarm her pale countenance, on which there appeared an expression of settled despair. "'Oh, I dare say I shall like spirits well enough now,' she said. "'At all events I feel an inclination for them to-night. "'But come, sit up and eat.' Thus speaking, she spread open a large brown paper parcel before the thief, whose eyes sparkled when he beheld a quantity of slices of recently cooked meat, a loaf of bread, and some cheese. Forgetting how the viands were procured, Josh Pedler began to devour them with the voracity of one who had fasted a long time, and Matilda hastened to fetch him some beer. When she returned she sat down and drank two glasses of raw gin, with but a few moments' interval between the drams, and then bursting out into a hysterical laugh she said, "'Blue ruin is capital stuff. I feel myself fit for anything now.' "'That's right, old gal. Cheer up!' exclaimed Josh Pedler. "'Take another glass, and then you'll be able to eat a bit of this meat.' "'Well, perhaps I may,' cried Matilda. "'I was tipsy when you and me were married by the old parson in the padding ken, "'and I'll be tipsy tonight, as it's the first of a new period of my life.' "'Damn it, you are coming out strong, Tilda,' ejaculated Josh Pedler. "'Blue ruin, padding ken. Why, I never heard you pat or flash before.' "'Oh, you don't know what you may see me do yet,' said the young woman, "'in a voice indicative of unnatural excitement.' And what does it matter? Perhaps you'll hear me cursing and swearing tomorrow. Anything, anything, she added, her voice changing to a tone of deep, intense feeling. Anything, so long as one can only grow hardened. And having tossed off a third glass of liquor, she accepted and ate the portion of food that Josh Pedler handed to her, although but a few minutes before she recoiled from it as if it were her own flesh and blood. 
"'Now you are acting like a sensible woman,' said Josh, "'and you make me feel more comfortable. "'But when you first come in I couldn't make out what the devil possessed you. "'You looked all queer-like, just as if you was going to commit suicide.' "'Suicide? Ha, ha!' laughed Matilda strangely. "'Well, I did think of it as I was coming home, but I remembered that you was here, hungry, starving, and too ill to get up and shift for yourself. So I came back, Josh. But won't you have some gin? You don't know what good it does one. If I had only taken some before I went out just now, that is, if I had had the money to buy it, I shouldn't have gone whimpering along the street as I did. No wonder all the poor girls who walk the pavement drink so much gin. I am already quite another person. I do declare that I could sing. But here comes someone up the stairs. It can't be for us. Yes, it is, though, said Josh Pedler, as the heavy steps of a man halted at the door to which a fist was applied by no means lightly. Come in. The visitor obeyed this invitation without farther ceremony, and the moment Josh caught sight of his countenance he cried joyfully, Tim the Snammer! End of section 71 Recording by Philip Gould